Okay, well, I want to welcome everyone here. It's a wonderful turnout for the first of uh, three lectures. Let me uh, mute everyone. So I'm going to uh, mute people who are not the speaker. And at the end of the, the lecture, we'll, we'll allow people to unmute themselves. Um, so uh, as I was saying, it's, it's a pleasure to have everyone here and to have uh, a great speaker like Amari Lambert speaking. He'll give a series of three lectures this week, next week, and the following week, and then we'll have a week off, and then Alison Etheridge will give another series of three lectures. And the, the broad subject will be on the interactions between biology and probability, um, which is all the more relevant these days as we sit at home uh, thinking about the implications of that. So um, as far as how things will go, if you have questions, you should uh, put them in the group chat. If a question can be answered by people in the chat, then that will work. And if other, if, if necessary, otherwise, um, I or, or, or another host will uh, will ask Amore the question. At the end of the talk, we'll have a chance for for an active question period, um, and we'll also uh, join together in, in applauding the, the talk. Uh, the, the last thing I want to say is that th this series of talks is a joint venture um, organized through Columbia University through the um, the Irving Institute for Cancer Dynamics uh, that Simon Tavare is in charge of and the uh, Probability and Society Initiative that I'm leading. And so uh, we hope that there'll be many more uh, of these sorts of activities over time and we really appreciate everyone attending. Uh, so with that, let me pass this off to Amare who will uh, start the first of his lectures. All right, thank you very much, Ivan. So the, the title of, the, of this series of three lectures is Evolutionary Processes and Patterns of Biodiversity. And today I will talk about uh, the genealogy of, of one gene, how can we model that and why is it important for uh, predicting diversity and also how we can couple, how models can couple the genealogies of, of several genes. So as you can see from, the, from this first slide, I, I'm, a, I'm a professor uh, at Sorbonne University, but I also uh, have a, a research group at, at Collège de France, it's called SMILE, for, uh, as you can see uh, on the bottom, stochastic models for the influence of life evolution. Uh, it started nine years ago, and um, during these lectures, I, I will uh, mainly talk, I mean, as far as my research, research is concerned, I will mainly talk about uh, works that has been done in collaboration with the uh, very talented people that I, I have had the luck to co collaborate with uh, during these years. So just to um, um, explain why uh, evolution and models, uh, I, I, want, I would like to uh, emphasize the fact that uh, the, the discoverers of uh, the notion, the, the theory of evolution, of the reality of evolution, uh, Lamarck, Wallace, and Darwin, especially Darwin, because he uh, identified the, the, the very mechanisms of evolution and, uh, and supported his theory with, with the wealth of evidence. But he was not the only one. Actually, a lot of researchers at the time uh, knew that uh, biodiversity, as we know it, was a result of a process uh, and was not like fixed and uh, given. Uh, and that this process uh, had some uh, generic properties. And because it has some generic properties, it lends itself to, to modeling. And as you can see from uh, the two, uh, the, the two uh, bullet points, uh, there are two kinds of models. And basically, the first lecture today, we talk about uh, models of microevolution of population genetics, which is concerned with the, uh, uh, with the uh, let's say, the variation through time of, uh, of uh, frequencies of a given types, genetic types, uh, inside a population of the same species. And the, the, the second type of models are models of, of macroevolution for really the, uh, the uh, appearance, the emergence of, of new species. And I, I provided you with, a, with a, some uh, like celebrated uh, uh, papers uh, that were seminal in, uh, in both these fields. Uh, I love the, the cartoons on, on the left. You see the, the cartoon by Darwin, which is uh, quite well known, um, uh, showing the, the descendants with modification. And the, the other cartoon is, is uh, less well known, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting. It's the first uh, simulation of, uh, of a phylogenetic tree showing uh, the uh, emergence of new uh, genera, uh, genus, genera, uh, and the number of species inside them. So let me introduce the, the, the topic. 
so the, the basic question that I want to address today um, is, uh, is as follows. So, so assume that you can sample n individuals from the population. Say so you sample n, uh, I don't know, crabs or clams on the, on, the, on the beach, or I don't know, like maybe uh, 10 spiders or uh, 10 uh, apples or olives. And then you, you sequence their DNA. Okay? You sequence their DNA. And the question that I want to address is what diversity you expect to observe in the sample of DNA sequencing. Actually, the short answer is that you will observe this. It's called a, a, a multiple sequence alignment. And basically, each row is a different DNA sequence. So each column is the site on the sequence. Okay? And so you can compare all these sequences by the colors. Each of the four colors corresponds to uh, one of the four uh, nucleotides, ATGNs. All right? And of course, uh, the long answer is, uh, is uh, it's much longer. It's the topic of this of this lecture, um, and so there are there are two things that I want to um, to insist on: uh, is that uh, diversity, the genetic diversity in your sample, uh, is is uh, is caused by two main factors. The first, of course, are mutations. Right? If there are differences between these sequences due to mutation, and the higher the mutation rate, the larger the diversity of your of, in your sample. It's, it's, it's easy to understand. The, the second, uh, the, the, the second um, sorry, uh, factor is the genealogy. The genealogy uh, between uh, the individuals in your sample. Uh, it's easy also to understand that the closely related they are, the more closely related they are, and the less diversity you will see in the sample. Okay? So what's, what's the genealogy? A genealogy, so this genealogical tree is actually not what we are going to consider at least, uh, at least for now. Uh, in the first part of this lecture, we will uh, not consider these uh, so-called pedigrees, which are genealogies with two parents, but we will only consider genealogies with one parent, okay? Because one uh, locus, which is a location on the genome, may be small enough for uh, not undergoing recombination, maybe a site, a single site on the genome has only one parent, okay? And so uh, I will use this term locus, which is a, a, a very uh, widespread in, in genetics and in genomics uh, and has several uh, meanings. Basically, a generic, generic word for uh, a small location of the genome. And it, since it, it's inherited from one single parent, the gene genealogy is much simpler than the pedigree that you see on the bottom uh, right panel. Of course, now if you look at different loci, you have to remember that half of our genes come from our mother and the other half come from our father. And so if you iterate this to your parents, grandparents, great grandparents, you will understand that different loci, different genes on your genome have different genealogy. In diploid species, each chromosome is in two copies in each cell. And each parent contributes one, one copy of each chromosome, as you know. And so the two copies of, the, of, of each of these chromosomes have different ancestry. One come from, from, comes from your father and the other one from your mother. And you can iterate this to uh, uh, other generations, okay, further back in time. But actually, even loci that are located on the same chromosome don't have the same genealogy. They, they, they cannot have the same genealogy. And this is due to recombination, a topic that I, I will also uh, consider in the follow-up. So the outline of the talk is as follows. I will first, uh, I will, I will first address or, or show models for the genealogy of one gene, and in particular, insist on coalescent theory, which is a very powerful tool in, the, in this field. Then I will use uh, these uh, models to uh, predict patterns of genetic diversity and one locus. And I will insist on the relation to population size because relatedness increases uh, or decreases the diversity and is also uh, linked to population size. Then I will talk about models coupling genealogies of several genes. And I will show you two applications. The first application is really uh, an application, right? So it has some uh, uh, it has some implications on the real world and how we how we understand it. How does genome-wide diversity inform us on the past demography? You will see that it's uh, it's amazing how we can do that. And the second question is more uh, theoretical question, and the 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 the, the drawing here or the, the figure here is here to illustrate this. Imagine that you start with uh, one population and that you paint the genome of each ancestor in a different color. And then you let recombination mix the colors 
of these genomes, how would the mosaic of colors in the population look like in the long run? And the amusing thing is that actually it's a question that we have partly answered with collaborators of, 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 uh, of ours. And it was inspired by this experimental evolution, uh, which result is, is shown on, on the figure uh, with 16 colors, 16 ancestors. And uh, here you see 30, uh, 300 sequences with different colors on the, on, on the chromosome corresponding to different ancestors. So let's start with the genealogy of one gene. So we need a model for that. And there is a very well-known model called the Canning's model, which is neutral in the sense that there is no natural selection ongoing here. And so you assume that for simplicity, the size of the population is constant, fixed equal to some capital N, which is assumed to be large, all right? Then to each individual I in, in generation T, you give, you give new IT children. And these children are part of generation T plus one. Okay, so you're left with this uh, random genealogy here. And Canning's model is a model where you assume that all these vectors, vectors of numbers of children at generation T are independent copies of the same vector, new one, new two, new n. Of course, they are different values, but they are drawn from the same distribution. Well, of course, since you want the population size to remain constant, the sum of the new i's has to be equal to n. And because you don't want natural selection to come into play, you want the law of new one, new two, new n to be invariant by permutation, meaning that every individual plays the same law. Okay, in, in probability theory, we say that this law is exchangeable. A specific instance of the Canning's model is, is that we, I will use repeatedly in the following is called the right Fisher model, where new one, new n is multinomial with parameters n, one over n, one over n. This actually means that each individual in generation t plus one picks her parent uniformly and independently in generation t. Okay, so remember that right Fisher model is very simple. Take each individual at generation t plus one and you pick the parent from generation t uniformly and independently. So let me now present coalescent theory just for two reasons. Assume that you, you are at some generation, at fixed time, since the genealogy, as, as you saw in Canning's model and, and a fortiori for a right Fisher model, is stationary in time, it can be any time. You sample two individuals uniformly at random and you follow their ancestors backwards in time, exactly as, as on the cartoon at the bottom panel. You let t sub n of two be the number of generations counted backwards until the two lineages find their most recent common ancestor, MRCA, okay? So you follow the lineages of these genes, record that we are only interested in one locus, so we don't need two parents, you just need to uh, consider one parent per individual. And you can follow these lineages until you find two sisters, and when you find two sisters, generation afterwards, they find their most recent common ancestor. So you see that Tn of two is geometric with success probability, the probability that two random lineages, random individuals are sisters, okay? Call that C sub n. In the right Fisher model, of course, C sub n is just one over n. Otherwise you can express C sub n as a function of the new eyes. For example, by writing the first here, the, the, the first um, expression, uh, which tells you the probability which breaks down into the probability of falling for two individuals to fall into the same sisterhood and then using exchangeability to get the third uh, expression. And now if Cn goes to zero as n tends to infinity, then your geometric random variable goes to a, an exponential random variable when you rescale it by one over Cn to an exponential with parameter one. In the right Fisher model, Tn of two is big of n, and Tn of two over n converges in distribution to an exponential random variable with parameter one, okay? So remember that in these population models, the time to most recent common ancestor are of the order of one over Cn in the right Fisher model of the order of one over, uh, in the order of capital N, okay? So now what happens for small n individuals? So you assume that you sample small n individuals uniformly at random, and you do the same, okay? You follow their ancestors backwards in time. Now we have to use two, two quantities. The first, you already know it, probability that two random individuals are sisters. 
And now D sub n is the probability that three random individuals are suspect. Okay. And the probability that when you sample three individuals at random, they, are, they have the same, the same value. In particular, in the right Fisher model, dn is 1 over n squared. And the theorem, which is due to, to, uh, to Muller, is, tells you the convergence to, for all these models under the assumption that dn over n over cn goes to zero, which is the case in the right Fisher model. The genealogy of the sample converges when you rescale it by c sub n. Okay? Remember that you have to count time in the time scale of one over cn. Okay, so if you rescale by one over cn, then you get convergence of the pro of the of the of the genealogy to Kingman's coalescence. Before I describe what is Kingman's coalescence, just look at the bottom panel where you see four realization of this tree. Okay, so it's a, a binary tree, and so as you go from the bottom to the top, you see less and less lineages. And now the description tells you that the waiting time T of K from K to K minus one lineages is exponential with parameter K to two. Okay, so you, re you recover the previous result with K equals two. And of course, the next coalescing pair is chosen uniformly at random. Okay, so it's, it amounts to saying that each pair of lineages coalesces independently at rate one. Now this is for the case when the, the population size is constant two times. But imagine that the population size is of the order of some scaling factor capital N, but fluctuates through time on time scales of the order of, of N. Okay, so basically it means that the population size at time t is N times X of NT, where X is some, some smooth function of time. Then the rate at which two lineages coalesce is one over X of T, okay? It makes sense, the less, the, the, the larger the population and the smaller the coalescence rate, all right? So you see that under this assumption that dn over cn goes to zero, which again holds under the right Fisher model, you see that you don't get multiple mergers. The resulting tree in the limit is binary. You also see that the, the waiting times are smaller when there are a large number of, of, of lineages, okay? So shorter edge lengths close to present, close to the tips. Also, this model is sampling consistent. What does this mean? It means that if you start from a tree with n plus one tips, you take one of these tips away, you look now at what the tree spanned by the uh, n tips that remain, and what you get is exactly the Kingman coalescent with n tips. Okay, so it's called sampling consistent. And also note that the genealogy of small n individuals, exactly as in the case when n equals two, has a length and a depth, which is of the order of capital N in the right Fisher model, of the order of one over c sub n in the in, gen in the general case. And I've added this note just for a mathematical purpose that the way the usual way the, the Kingman coalescent or, or these trees are represented is by a partition value process where uh, the, the, the state of the process at time t is the, is the partition into blocks where i and j are in the same block if they have found their most common recent common ancestor at time t, right? So this block is actually a subtree. Now just a, a, quick, a quick result that uh, I will use in my third lecture uh, so the fact that if you look at what happens when the number of tips goes to infinity. So we record that the process counting the number of lineages in the, in the coalescent is a pure depth process, okay, because it's binary tree. It's go, it goes from K to K minus one at rate K choose two, choose two. And so this means that the sum of all waiting times is finite because it has finite expectation. So this pure death process, this pure death process can be started at infinity and reaches finite values in finite time, okay? And of course, the same is true for the, the Kingman coalescent. You can start it at the, at the partition into singletons, singletons of capital N, and you get what is called the standard coalescent. 
So now let's go for uh, the patterns of genetic diversity that are predicted by this model. So don't look, don't look at the text here, just look at the, at, the, at the cartoon, okay? So the cartoon is actually not like, not very, well, not very clear, but so the, the, the idea is that here we have a genealogy on nine individuals, all right? Each of these individuals is endowed with a sequence. Oh, Marie, can I, can I ask a question from the last slide? Okay. So it, if you just go back to the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so is there a sort of limit shape phenomena that arises? You know, it, it seems like you have, you know, this random, birth, uh, this random death process, but if you kind of zoom out and, you know, look up at infinity, do, do you get a nice, you know, smooth Yeah, so I will, I, will talk, I will talk about that in my, my third lecture. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so let's go back to, to the, this genealogy with mutation. Each dot represent a mutation event, okay? And each mutation occurs at some site in the sequence. So you see the results on the two sequences here that I've, I've sketched, which are called haplotypes. Haplotypes are instances of the sequence. And you see that individual three carries three mutations at sites C, E, G, and H, all right? Because you see that on its lineage, on its lineage uh, from the, the root, to uh, individual three, there are four mutations hitting sites G, C, H, and E, okay? But now you have to bear in mind that, so what you can only do is compare the sequences, okay? So mutations are visible if they are present in a number of individuals equal to K, where K is between A and N minus one, okay? If a mutation is carried by everyone, you don't see it in the sample. You cannot differentiate it from the ancestral state, okay? For example, A here is not mutated. Everybody carries the ancestral state. But G is mutated for everyone. So everyone carried the derived state. You cannot see the difference when you see the data, all right? So the only mutations that are visible in the sample, they are called polymorphic or segregating. They occur, they must occur within the genealogical tree. And I recall that the, the length of the, of the tree is big of n, okay? So now I stick, I will stick with the, uh, with the right fissure model, okay? So the total length of the tree is big of n. So it means that for mutations to be visible in the, in the, in the, in the sample of, uh, in your multiple sequence alignment, you have to have you the probability of gene-wide mutation at birth lie in some Goldilocks zone. If n mu n is much smaller than one, you will see no segregating site in the sample. Everybody will carry the same sequence. If n mu n is larger, is much larger than one, you will see infinitely many segregating sites in the sample. Basically, all the sequences will be totally different. Nothing will, uh, nothing will be common. But now the Goldilocks zone is when n mu n is bigger of one. Then you will see a finite number of mutations. A conditional on true length, of course, in the limit, it will be a Poisson random variable. Now, if you assume this and the sequence is long enough, then mutations all occur, all occur at different sites. Okay, if, the, if actually the mutation rates are not so different, we so range over the, the sequence, then all mutations occur at different sites. And it's called the infinitely many site model. Okay, so you have mutations that each time hit a different site. Now, if you look, at the result, if you look at the sequence called haplotype that each of the individuals in the sample carries, then each mutation gives rise to a new haplotype. And so it's called, <clears throat> for this reason, it's also called the infinity many allele model, all right? Okay, so let's, let me introduce some, uh, some mutation. So recall that the population size is fixed, equal to capital N. We need N U N to be of the order of one, so I can assume that U N is equal to theta over 2n, where theta is some parameter. And now it's easy to see that as n goes to infinity, you get convergence of the genealogy with mutation to Kingman's coalescent with Poissonian marks occurring at rate theta over 2 on the lineages of the tree. Okay? So in the limit, we don't care about the details of the model. We have some universal 
uh, some, some universal limit, which is this uh, binary uh, random tree with Poissonian marks. Okay, okay. And then to characterize the genetic diversity of the sample, there are various things that you can do, various uh, quantities that you can define. The first, S sub n is the number of polymorphic sites, also equal to sum over k of Sn of k, where Sn of k is the number of, of polymorphic sites carried by exactly k individuals. Okay. So for each site, you know how many individuals carries it. All those which are carried by k, you put them into one uh, into one basket, and, and you count the number of these of these uh, such sites. And you call that Sn of k. The knowledge of Sn of k as k ranges from one to n minus one is called the site frequency spectrum. I won't talk very much about it, but it's a, it's a very important uh, quantity in population genetics. Note that conditional on total tree length L sub n, Sn is Poisson with parameter theta ln over two. Okay, so it's very simple to, to characterize the distribution. Now, if you look at A sub n, it's the number of distinct haplotypes, okay, the number of distinct sequences. This can also be written as the sum of An of k, where An of k is the number of haplotypes carried by k individuals. And this time, the knowledge of An of k as k ranges from 1 to n, not n minus 1, because everybody can carry the same sequence. You, you get what, what is known as the allele frequency spectrum. Okay? A haplotype is also called an allele. And since haplotypes induce a partition of the sample called the allelic partition, the sum of k An of k must be equal to small n. Okay? So different ways of characterizing the genetic diversity in the sample. Either you count the polymorphic sites and by how many individuals they are, they are carried, or you count the number of haplotypes, or you count the number of haplotypes carried by exactly k individuals. I'm right. Can I clarify some of these definitions just to make sure I understand? So um, the total tree length is is that if you sum over all of the different uh, branches, right? That so up to, up to, total number of all some points. Yeah. All tree. Like the most recent common ancestor. Sorry, I should have, should, have, should have specified. Okay. And when you, the difference between a, haplo, a, a polymorphic site and the number of haploids. So the polymorphic sites are just sites where there's a difference. Exactly. So you just look at one column. Okay. And if this column is, has two or more colors, here always two, has two colors. You mm -hmm. remember the multiple sequence alignment. You right. say that this site is polymorphic or okay. okay. And the number of distinct haploids. So, so what what is a distinct haploid again? So, so a haplotype. A haplotype is really the knowledge of a sequence. Okay. So you look at all your sequence. Some of them are exactly similar. They carry exactly the same mutation. Oh, so okay. You have to see the same colors, and some are so different. GFB yeah. is the same as GFB. Yeah. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. All right, so, so there was a, a, a very well-known result characterizing the law of the allelic partition and it's called E1 sampling formula. I will try to walk you through uh, a simple proof that is very well uh, explained in uh, uh, the book by Rick Deret about models for uh, DNA sequence evolution. So remember that we look at this coalescent here on the, on the right panel, an N coalescent, so starting with N, N individuals with Poissonian mutations. And recall that each mutation gives rise to a new type, right? Because we're in infinitely many sites or infinitely many allele models. And so we don't really care about mutations. We, we only care, sorry, about the first mutations that we encounter when we go from the tip to the root, okay? And so these, these mutations are, are colored. The mutations that occur before have no incidence on the haplotypes. They have an incidence on the sites, on the polymorphic sites, but not on the haplotypes. Okay? If, you don't, if you only want to know the uh, allelic partition, you, just, you can just freeze the coalescence as soon as it encounters one, one mutation. And so you're left with a coalescence, which has a pairwise rate one, so basically a quadratic uh, rate with deaths that occur at rate theta over two. Now, if you reverse time and you change time, you, you go from a quadratic rate to a linear rate and to a linear rate to a constant rate, you get a birth process, rate one with, with immigration 
migration. So it rate the uh, yeah it rates it down. Yeah, that's, that's that's correct. And so basically the partition that you that, that you see here on the right panel, you can also get it by a birth process with immigration, each immigration being a different type. Okay. A third equivalent way of characterizing the partition is called the Chinese restaurant process. It's also a very uh, well-known and studied process uh, model in, in probability theory. And it's a partition into tables of the restaurant. So when the K plus first customer enters the dining room, you assume that she sits next to customer I with probability one over K plus theta. There are already K individuals in the room. So if you sum, you get K over K plus theta. Or she sits at an empty table, meaning a new type with probability theta over K plus theta. Okay, these three models are equivalent. And using either of these three models, you can get this theorem due to uh, Warren Ewens, which gives you exactly the formula for the law of a n of one and a n of n. Okay. Actually, I think it's simpler to uh, use the, the formulation, which is on the bottom left, which tells you that a n of one, a n of two, a n of n has the same law as the vector y1, y2, yn conditional on the sum of k, yk equals n due to the allelic partition, where the yk's are independent and a yk follows a Poisson distribution with parameter theta over k. Okay, so it's also known as the harmony of the harmonic frequency spectrum because it decreases like one over k. Okay, so we have many singletons, many pairs, a little less triples, etc. Okay. And now another thing which is interesting is what happens when you look at a large sample. When you look at a large sample, you can prove that Sn and An are both of the order of theta log n. So as n grows, you see a saturation of the number of new types that you observe in the sample. Also, when you look at small families, mutations that are carried by a small number of individuals, which are actually basically the most recent mutations, mutations that occur close to the tips of the tree, you lose the conditioning and an of k converges the distribution to a Poisson random variable with the parameter theta of k. But what, what's even more interesting is large families. So the large families are the mutations, where by family I mean all individuals carrying the same haplotype. The large families are due to mutations that occur close to the root, okay? When a mutation occur, occurs close to the root and there's no mutation under it, it's carried by a lot of individuals in the sample. Okay, and it's a, it's actually a, a result which is uh, due to Donnelly and, and Tabaray, but it's a general result which is inherent to the Chinese breakdown process, and it tells you that the sizes of the oldest families, so the oldest mutations, the, the mutations that have occurred in the tree, most closer to the to the to the root, uh, closest to the root. They're all of the order of n, okay? They represent a macroscopic fraction of the sample. And you can characterize their, uh, their law when you rescale xn of k by n, by small n, the size of the sample. You get a convergent to what is known as the gem vector for Griffith, Engen, and, and McCloskey, pk, where pk is defined by the, <clears throat> by the formula of this type, thanks to uh, an independent sequence of, of zi, which are all beta, one beta, random variables. <coughs> it's simpler to understand this as a, what is called the stick breaking procedure, <clears throat> where you start by throwing in the unit interval Z1, okay? And Z1 tells you the frequency gives you P, P1, is the frequency of the oldest family in your sample, okay? So it's a macroscopic fraction of the sample, the oldest one. To get the second oldest, you get rid of the leftmost part and you throw again a new independent beta random variable into the, the interval, the remaining interval, and you get the second order. And you do that again and again, and you see that what you get is what is called the mass partition of the, of the unit interval, which sums to one. Okay. So you get, so you have this, let's say, a dual description of the small families which really behave like a harmonic spectrum. And the oldest families that if you see this as a spectrum are just like small uh, small uh, columns on your histograms, which are far, far apart on the right. But if you look 
uh, if you characterize them this way, you get a very nice, uh, uh, very nice limit. Now let's go to the application I mentioned about estimating population size. Recall that, as I said briefly, when population size increases, when you sample uniformly individuals from this population, their relatedness will decrease, right? The chance that you have sampled, say, relatives decreases. And so the diversity of the sample increases. Actually, what we've seen is that the diversity, when it's measured by the number of polymorphic sites, increases linearly with population size. Indeed, mutation probability UN is known, and you can measure it by diverse uh, procedures. Of course, it varies through time and, and along the sequence, but let's say it's known. Then, then any estimator of theta, since theta is equal to two and u, it yields an estimate of n. Okay? And for example, the Waterstone estimator tells you that Sn over log n is an estimator of theta, all right? And so you see this linear relationship between theta or n and the diversity, the number of polymorphic sites, okay? Now that's for, let's say that this is for integrate, let's say integrating over all genealogies, all possible genealogies, okay? So the, the results that I presented previously are by integrating over, over the law of the Kingman coalition. But now assume that you know the genealogy. The genealogy predicts genetic diversity. But also, on the, other, on the other way around, genealogy can be inferred from genetic diversity. For example, if you take n equals 2, the probability of identity, the probability of finding the same sequences, the same haplotypes called homozygosity, or, or have the same uh, value of the, of the site, same base on the two sites. It's one minus u n over two n over two two n of two, sort of, sorry to the two t n of two because the total number of generations to the time to must to t m r c a you have to go back to go from the tips to the root and to the root from the tips and you want no mutation to have occurred on this path and so the and so you see the relation between the, the probability of homozygosity and uh, Tn of two, okay? So imagine that you have one genealogy for the whole sequence, and you look at the fraction of, of sites that are homozygous, meaning identical by state, or heterozygous, meaning two different states, and you get an estimator of their time to most recent common ancestor, okay? So if you assume that N is constant, and that the value, as I just said, of the time to most recent common ancestor can be estimated from the diversity that you observe. Then, since Tn is geometric with parameter 1 over n, an estimator of capital N is just 1 over Tn. Okay? So let me go through this again. You look at the diversity of your sample. You assume that you have, a, you have means, like previously explained, of inferring the time to most recent common ancestor, then the population size can be estimated by one over this time. And now if the population size is not constant, remember what, I, what I've shown earlier, if it varies through time like n times x of nt, where x is a smooth function of time, then you get this formula for the limiting distribution of tn over n. And so you see the dependence between the distribution of Tn of two, time to most recent common ancestor, and the fluctuations of population size. Now recall that different genes have different genealogies. So in theory, the distribution instead of the value of Tn of two, not the value, but the distribution, can be estimated from diversity at let's say many independent loci, then the variations of n through time can be inferred. Okay. Not only the value of n, but their variations. All right. So it requires understanding how genealogies of different genes are coupled. And this is what I'm going to go through now. So here, the example of a bottleneck, just before I go through the, 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 the models of recombination. When you see here a, provi a provisional reduction in population size called bottleneck, then you see that you, you will see coalescence times that are, will be more often than not 
uh, exactly at the, at, the, at the moment of the bottleneck. And so the density of quiescence times will peak at bottleneck time. So let's couple these genealogies of different low sites. So for, for to do this, we need to consider the right future model, but with recombination and two parents, okay? So assume that you have constant population size, but now you have two parents per individual, and each individual carries one chromosome. You can assume that this chromosome mathematically is a sequence of sites, a discrete sequence, or the interval zero, one, any linear object. And at each generation, each individual chooses her two parents uniformly at random, exactly as in the right Fisher model with one parent. Now you have to decide since each individual carries one chromosome and you have two parents, you have to decide what chromosome does the, the child carry. So I have two possibilities. The first possibility is with priority rho over n, where rho is called the recombination rate. The two parental chromosomes recombine and you uniformly uh, throw some points in the chromosome and you mix the two colors, okay? And you get what you see in the middle of the, of the, of the figure, okay? Otherwise, only one of the two chromosomes is passed on with uniform uh, probability, okay? So most of the time you just, you just draw one of the two chromosomes and you, and you, and you, uh, you pass it or you recombine the two chromosomes that's a uniformly distributed cut point for crossover, okay? And so what when you see this feature- yeah. Murray, what does this uniformly distributed crossover mean exactly? So like if you were combining not just a pure uh, orange and, and green or blue, you know, if you had something that already had a mix, how would you define the crossover between them? So I, I didn't hear very well, but I, 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 can, I can answer that. Okay, so for simplicity, we assume that the point where we mix the two colors is uniform, but it could be any distribution. And of course, in reality, there are actually recombination hotspots where you know that recombination has a larger probability to occur. Actually, it even changes through evolutionary time. But here for simplicity, we assume that the point where you mix orange and, 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 and green here is uniform. Is that, is that clear? Uh, yeah, I guess, but you know, if, if the two parents themselves were not just pure green and pure orange, if they themselves were, you know, a mixture, do you do yeah. that in a super, you know, superposition? Okay, 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 okay. So, so, so for now, uh, like, forget about state, okay? You forget about the state, but assume, so you just take one of the, of course, they, they might be of the same color, okay? So if, there are two, if the two are blue, then whatever happens, you get a blue chromosome. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so if you look at that, you see that a site which is, let's say, on the top of the, of the chromosome and a site which is at the bottom of, the, of this vertical chromosome has, they have two different parents, okay? They have two different parents. One comes the father and, and the other comes from the mother, all right? So the, the coalescent now will, will change, okay? Like, and the coalescent now is called the ancestral recombination graph. So assume that you just have these two sites and just, just have one individual, you sample one individual and you look at the lineages of two sites on, the, on its chromosome, on her chromosome. Assume that there are distance L and you follow the ancestry as time goes backward just as on the, on the right panel. So at, at each generation, the common line of descent of this block splits with probability, which is proportional to rho over n, the probability of recombination times L, which is the distance between these two sites, okay? So most of the time, as you can see, the, the, the first two generations, they are in the same individual. And after two generations, one goes to the father and the other goes into the mother, all right? And then as n goes to infinity, the time rescale, and of course you have singleton, you have the, sorry, coalescences with probability one over n. And so when you rescale time, the ancestral recombination graph just has two states. Either the two lineages of your two sites are in the same individual, or they are in two different individuals. And the, the rates are rho l and one, okay? 
if you look at three sites, it's a little bit more involved. So you start with three sites, let's say green, blue, and red. And then this block, so they all follow, they all follow the same uh, the same individuals. They all come from father, father, mother, mother. And at some point, there is a recombination. So recombination occurs at a rate which is proportional to rho L2, which is equal in the, in the time we scale process to rho L2 between xy on, on the one hand and z on the other hand, and to rho L1 between for the separating the green on the one hand and the red and the blue on the, on the other hand. Okay, And when they are separated, as you can see on the cartoon, block xy will split into two at, rho, at rate rho L1, block yz at rate rho L2, but block, block xyz, block xz, sorry, at rate L1 plus L2. Okay, because the sites are distant of L1 plus L2. Okay? And so, and of course, each pair of lines coalesces at rate one. So you see that if you look at just, you sample one individual, you can characterize the state of your ancestral recombination graph on these K sites, here K equals three, by your Markov process, which is valued in the partitions of one K, but here has a total different meaning uh, than, the, than the Kingman coalescent. It means that all the, all the, uh, all the, the integers are, are in the same block correspond to all sites that are in the same individual at, the, at that time. Okay. Could you, could you just say, so the vertical direction in your picture is time. What does the horizontal direction exactly mean? So there's no, there's no horizontal direction set as in the other cartoons, it's just each row is a population. So each row corresponds to a generation. And there are here like 10 individuals in each generation. Keep the, the population size equal to capital N constant. So there's no, there's no order on the x axis. OK. Of course, the, the, the lines are, I chose, I chose to not let them cross, but uh, there's no, they could, they could cross, right? They could intersect these lines. OK, so the fact that they kind of look like sticky Brownian motions or sticky processes is just the way. Yeah, it's just the effect of uh, trying to be to, to make it like a, a clear figure, but uh, oh. yeah, yeah, maybe it's confusing. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you sample now more than one individual, it becomes even it becomes even more involved because now in addition the same color lines, when they come into the same individuals, the same individual they coalesce into one single line, okay? And so you get this kind of picture. I won't go into the details of the, let's say of the, of the race of this, uh, and even the state phase of this process. But you can observe that the green and blue loci, they have the same time to most recent common ancestor. One, two, three, four, five. You see that the, the green and the red locus they find their most recent common ancestor and they have exactly the same tree until their most recent common ancestor. Whereas the red locus, because of the recombination that occurs on the right, on the bottom right after two generations, has a different history and so, and so has a time to most recent common ancestor, which is four generations later. Do you see that? So the ancestral recombination graph is a way of accounting for, for the fact that different sites, different loci on your genome may have different ancestries. As, as I, I tried to show on the first picture, the, the most simple picture where you just have one chromosome uh, being, uh, two chromosomes being recombined. And because of this, you can assume that you can have in mind a picture where you move along the chromosome and you see a sequence of trees, right? So you forget, forget about what happens upstream of the most recent common ancestor, okay? Just look at the, the tree of each of these sites, each of these loci. So the, the green and the red, they have exactly the same, the same tree, okay? So here it's just a cherry, it's a tree with two tips. But the red has a different tree. And called IBD segment for identical by descent, a maximal connected segment of sites which share exactly the same genealogy. So basically, this looks like this. 
So here you have small n equals four. The IBD segments are segments with the same color. The dependencies between these trees is, is complex as you, as, you, as you saw. And you see that different, you see that you have maximal segments that share the same genealogy. And even if you don't care or didn't get the details in the previous slides, the important things, the important point is that these trees are different because of recombination. So if there was no recombination, all the genome will, would have the same genealogy. Okay, because of recombination, all these loci can have different genealogies. And another important point is that shallow trees, like the red one here in the middle, are carried by a longer IBD segment. Because when the most recent common ancestor is recent, the probability of observing a recombination from between now and the, and the MRCA is small. And so because this probability is small, the segment is larger. Okay. So maybe don't maybe forget about the the, uh, the law of this tree sequence. Actually, it's quite complicated, but bear in mind this idea that for a sample of sequences, you have a succession of IBD segments which carry the same gene genealogy, and the longer segments correspond to shallow trees. So now let us talk about two applications. So as I, as I just said, the ARG, the ancestral recombination graph, shows complex dependencies between the gene trees, okay, the trees of different, of different loci. And so for applications, McVean and Cardin in 2005 proposed an approximation which is called the SMC for sequentially Markovian coalescent. Which, which gives you a Markovian approximation to the ARG as we move along the chromosome. Okay, so it's a sequence of trees which is Markovian along the chromosome and the, 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 the law that, that they propose the following, you start from a gene tree with total length capital L. You wait an exponential distance on the chromosome with parameter rho L because rho is the recombination rate. And at this, at this point, at the end of this IBD segment, so for this whole distance, you keep the same tree. And at this distance rho L, you change the tree. How do you change the tree? You throw a uniform point in the, in the tree, you detach the lineage, and you regraft it as in the coalescent. Okay, so you see here succession of trees. And you see, you're, sorry, you see the transition uh, represented on the, on the right panel. And now I, I would like to uh, talk to talk to you about what what I think is really a tour de force done by Lee and Durbin in uh, in, in 2011, which amounts to basically inferring the history of human population thanks to one single genome. Sorry, one single individual. Why am, am I saying this? Because one individual is one diploid genome. And so it's basically two sequences. And what, what they've done is the following. They considered SMC, but for just two individuals. So it's called pairwise SMC, PSMC. And the idea is to infer the past variations of population size from these two sequences by a hidden Markov model, where the hidden state is the time to most recent common ancestor. So what they do is that they, they infer the IBD segments and these IBD segments have the same TMRCA. And depending on the density of heterozygous sites, you can see on the right, the sites where the two sequences show, the, show different states, they can infer the time to most recent common ancestor exactly as what I suggested a couple of slides ago. And the idea is that a shallow tree corresponds to a long segment with a low density of heterozygous sites and a deep tree corresponds to a short segment with a high density of heterozygous sites. You can see that on the, on the bottom panel, where you see long IBD segments with a small TMRCA and a very short segment with a, a deep TMRCA. And from the TMRCA, of course, they can infer the time to, the, sorry, the variations of the population size, as I tried to explain 
uh, five or six slides ago. And here what they got. So here they have six genomes, six diploid genomes. And the red and the, the red and the green are of African descent. They are Yoruba, Yoruba uh, people. And you see that they differ their history of the population size of their ancestors differs from the Asian and European uh, genomes. Uh, various conclusions, they've drawn uh, various conclusions, including the, let's say the, the last one, which uh, is the most interesting, interesting for the, for the, the 10 minutes that uh, are, are left. You see that around 100,000, so 10 to the five years ago, you see that they infer an elevated population size. Okay. Actually, what they think is that it's an artifact due to the structure of the population in Africa at that time that is believed to involve small isolated populations that were separately evolving. So why is that? Because if you still, if you, if you stick to this picture of lineages going back in time, and coalescing when they find their most recent common ancestor. If they travel in a large population, you will wait a long time until they find that, that time to most recent common ancestor. If they travel inside small subpopulations which are separately evolving, then they will get trapped into this subpopulation. And you will also wait a long time until you find their most recent common ancestor. And so these deep TMRCAs can be either due to a large population size or to, or to a population substructure. So just for the yeah, five to 10 minutes that are, are left, I, I want just to mention uh, two works that we, we've been doing that we, we've published this year uh, in the group. The uh, first, first uh, work was about a quantitative assessment of extinction risk, thanks to this kind of technique. In 2015, we published a, a paper on the, the assessment of, of extinction risk thanks to um, survey data of, uh, of uh, 200 uh, uh, species. And, and we actually, we, we realized that um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature used um, very poor, poor statistical uh, tools to uh, do this assessment. And so we had the idea of using uh, genomic tools to, uh, to do that. And so here's a, a proof of concept where the goal is to detect a decline from kappa N0 to N0, to N0 generations ago, where N0 is some, some scaling factor. So we, can, we cannot use PSMC because the, the source of signal on the IPD segment for very recent uh, time to most recent common ancestor is quite weak. And so we used another statistical uh, 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 a measure which is uh, which, we, which we call the maximum LG block, LG standing from li for linkage discovery, where uh, an MLD block is the maximal segment where the mutations that you see on your multiple sequence alignment are compatible with a single tree. Doesn't mean that it's, it was actually an, an IBD segment, but in the data, they're compatible with the same tree. And so what we showed is that the normalized distribution of MLD block lengths that you can very simply and rapidly infer from the data is insensitive to population size when you rescale by the segment mean, but it's it is sensitive to population size variations. I should mention that it's the work of Edith Cardoncuff with our PhD student co-supervised co by Guillaume Machaz. And so you see on the top panel, the distributions of MLD block lengths so the, the gray and the, and the white correspond to two different population sizes. And the, and the black corresponds to uh, a decline uh, N0 generations ago. And you see that the distributions, the, the gray and the white are similar, but different from the black. And on the, on the bottom panel, you see the power of a detection uh, test based on this, uh, on, on this discrepancy. And you see that the, the power of the test uh, hits like is, 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 uh, is virtually equal to one for dates of decline, which are of the order of, of between 0.1 and 10, uh, and, and actually even larger than 50% for, 
for a smooth and recent decline. So it requires good quality sequences. And because of what I, I just mentioned for PSMC, of course, we also, uh, we, we also are subject to this problem. Uh, this, this test is sensitive to population structure. And we, we are currently working on that. Now for, for chromosome painting. So remember this, this, uh, this uh, I think, very elegant question. And you, you'll see a quite elegant answer also. Uh, so recall that the right fissure model with population size n and, and recommendation probability rho over n, where rho now is equal to r, uh, not to 1. Uh, sorry is equal to r, but r is also the, the length of the interval. Okay, so basically it means that the recombination rate is still uh, uh, equal to one per unit length of the chromosome. Now you start with n individuals and you paint each of these n initial sequences with a different color, just as on the cartoon. After some fixed amount of time, you pick one individual at random and you ask how does the mosaic of colors, which is the product of recombination acting during all this time on this chromosome look like? And actually, exactly as what you said, Ivan, if all these individuals carry the same mosaic, then you can recombine them, you will find the same mosaic. Okay? And so once everybody carries the same mosaic, the rec recombination has no, uh, has no action on it. Okay? So there is a time after which everybody carries the same, what we call the fixed mosaic. And the question is, how does this fixed mosaic look like? So record the ARG, the ancestor recombination graph. And record that it can be described by a partition of 0R when you sample one individual. Okay, you just sample one individual here at the bottom. You trace back the, the genial, sorry, the lineages of all the sites here three on the chromosome. You wait for, I don't know, maybe 20 generations. And at 20 generations, you look at which lineages are in the same ancestor. Here, they are all in different ancestors. And so the, the, the state of the partition here is, is into all singletons, OK? But if you, if you let this process evolve, you will see a partition of your chromosome also evolve, OK? The question is, how does the fixed mosaic look like? So it means that instead of having 20 generations between the initial state and the final state, you have an infinite amount of state. So what it means is that by perfect duality between these two processes, the partition that you obtain, the mosaic that you obtain at fixation is the same as the stationary state of this process. Okay, so the fixed mosaic is given by the stationary distribution of this partitioning process that was actually previously studied by uh, Esser, Probst, and Backer. And actually, so you, it's, a, I think, quite interesting process in its own right, where you have this partition into colors of your interval. And you have recombination occurring at rate one. And so here, the cluster here in blue splits into two, you get from bottom to top, splits into two. The, 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 on the left, it, it remains blue, but the colors are really uh, uh, are really uh, not important, and, and left purple on the right. But also, of course, each pair of clusters can independently coalesce. And here on the bottom, you see the red and the green, which coalesce into uh, one single cluster, which I painted red. But uh, okay. And so, what we what we obtained? It actually, I must I must uh, say that it was mainly the work of, uh, of Veronica Miropina and Emmanuel Scherzer, who, who co-supervise her, is the law of the cluster which contains zero. Okay, So you look at the color, which is, say, red, the color which is at the left extremity of the chromosome. And you say that zero is in relation with x if x position on the chromosome carries the same color. And you define the length of the cluster containing zero as L sub R. And since we want actually even more information on where the red is distributed across the, the sequence, the chromosome, we define the measure theta R of AB, which is the amount of red between R to the A and R to the B rescaled by log R. 
And the theorem tells you that LR over log R converges. Okay, so the total amount of, of red on the chromosome is of the order of log R, and when you rescale it, it converges. And more than that, theta R converges to a point measure, which gives you the locations of small segments and the total length that they represent. Okay, so the sum of yi delta xi, where xi, yr are the atoms of a Poisson point process with prescribed intensity. And so, so it's, it's my last slide, so don't, 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 uh, don't worry. I'm, I'm just, I just want to uh, explain the, the figure on the right. So the figure on the right tells you where is the red on the chromosome. And in the log logarithmic scale, it tells you the, the, the theorem on the left tells you that the segments IB with zero uh, are distributed according to this scale invariant Poisson point process with intensity one over X. So all these locations are the atoms of Poisson point process with intensity one over X. And the length of the, of the segment at location R to the X is exponential with, with mean X times log R. Actually, the insert shows that the there is a more complex geometry of these segments at the finer scale, which is not described by the, by the theorem. And so you see on this picture that there is uh, long range dependencies between uh, trees at different, uh, at different sites, because you see that you can uh, recover some red uh, uh, at, at, a, at a very uh, long distance from, uh, from the left extremity. So maybe I, I will skip this. It's a, it's a conjecture about the number of uh, ancestors contributing to the genome. And I will uh, uh, thank my uh, two collaborators, Guillaume and, uh, and Emmanuel Scherzer, Guillaume Machaz and Emmanuel Scherzer, and, uh, and the two uh, PhD students, uh, Elise Carboncuff and Veronica Miropina, uh, whose work I talked about. I will just browse across references just for the video. Don't pay attention. I'm going to go quickly through them. But then since it is recorded, I can do that. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let me uh, allow everyone to unmute themselves. You should be able to unmute yourself now. And if you'd like to join with me in thanking Amari for an excellent lecture. And uh, so be before we, we'll, we'll take a little bit of time for questions. If people have to go, they can go. Uh, but let me just mention, and I put this in the uh, group chat that, so the next lecture will be a, a week from now, the same time. Um, it's not the same place in the sense that if you use the same link, it's not going to bring you to the right room. Uh, so this is a little complicated. So for each week, you need to register for that week. And the link for registration I sent, um, it's on the website. You can go to, uh, and you, here's the link to the, the overall website. I will also try to send people a reminder of this. Um, so each person will get an individualized link when they register and that will be how you access the next talk. Um, we'll also post the recording of this uh, video as well as um, the slides uh, on, on the website as well. So um, are there any questions for Amare? And you can just unmute yourself and ask if you have one. Um, I have a question regarding uh how the research on pattern matching, uh, let's say after the recombination occurs, and uh, if there is a way to look backwards as one of the possibilities, and also within the transitions, if there is a way to keep track of uh, those patterns, how they project towards the next, um, you know, the, the next portion of, of the chain and uh, what other ways in general uh, there's a tracking on this uh, pattern matching and approximate pattern matching. I'm sorry, I, could, I couldn't hear very well. I, Ivan, could you repeat one of the two questions? I could hear there were two questions, but uh, I couldn't really hear their, their content. Okay, so basically I'm asking about the uh, studies on pattern matching in terms of tracking uh, the sequences, the DNA sequences, uh, let's say after the recombination of chromosomes, and uh, if there is a way to go backwards as well and uh, track them, and also within, uh, uh, in tra within transitions, 
um, if there is a way to do that, like you were talking about, I believe um, um, if I'm using the right term, among holotypes and, uh, you know, within transitions from one stage to the other, that there were uh, a sum of different uh, mutations, if that's the term to use. Yeah, yeah. So, you, so you're totally right. So a way of um, characterizing the diversity of the sample is to, so instead of like um, sampling from the distribution of the genealogy and, and then throwing mutations on it and try to uh, infer the law of the diversity from this representation, this hierarchical representation, you can also have like there are uh, there are methods that allow you to keep track of the state of um, either the population of the or the ancestors of the sample at time t and and uh, specify how this state uh, varies through time. So this is that this is something that can be done, for example, if you want to. Um, um, specify the, the distribution of uh, of SN of the number of polymorphic sites. You can do that, or maybe SN of K. I think it, this is this is presented in, in Durrett's book. As for um, going backwards in time, I I, I thought I is it? Do you think of something different from the ancestral recombination graph? Mm. Well, I'm just uh, looking at the possibility of, um, if I can say, there is a correlation between the before and the after that can be typified probabilistically. That's the idea. Or none, there is no such a, there's always so many possibilities of uh, pattern matching that uh, that probability has to be really a constraint of formula because of its own complexity. When you say before, before and after, you mean before and after on the chromosome? Before and after the end of an IBD segment or? After the recombination and prior to the, like if we look at families and I, I think the idea is if we're looking at the disease, for example, and, and a scientist wishes to study pattern matching in relation to perhaps finding a specific gene as a cause, then is it possible to go backwards and identify probabilistically that is the cause of getting this uh, recombination here, which is actually very associated with this disease? That's, that's um, the idea. Okay, I see. So, so yeah, so it's, a, it's a, let's say, quite different topic where um, you will use the fact that recombination cannot occur everywhere all the time. And so there are uh, variants, meaning sites which are polymorphic in the, in the human population, uh, some which are uh, linked with the disease or let's say causal in the disease and some which are not, but which are linked together because of common ancestry and because of the fact that recombination between the two doesn't occur too often. And so this is what is done in, in GWAS, genome-wide genome -wide association studies, is to um, find variants that are putatively, let's say that, that are uh, on the first approximation, uh, let's say neutral, not, not deleterious, um, but which are linked, which are carried, uh, by people who are more often uh, than the others, uh, uh, sorry, um, ill, and then to find map and try to sequence more precisely what occurs around this, uh, this variant and, and, and find maybe the mutation which is causal, which has a responsibility in the disease. But I, I, I'm not sure I, I'm answering exactly the question. The, the mathematics in, in this field are, are a little less involved than they, uh, I don't think they, or most most of them actually don't um, involve the uh, these, these models of uh, the ancestral recombination graph, but I, I, I might be mistaken. 
So there was um, a, a different type of question that was in the chat, which was just whether you uh, can recommend any sort of fun exercises or any um, maybe you know, some, something to reinforce what, what you were talking about today, whether there are particular things people should look at. Uh, and you gave quite a few references in the end. Is there any one in particular um, that has good exercises, for instance? That's the question. Um... It's in the it's in the chat. Uh, yeah, it was Giannis parentheses NYC. Uh, um, I I would say that the paper by View van Heijn is a is a, is a I mean it's, a, it's an old reference but uh, which uh, has a lot of information on uh, on this topic but uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure I got the question right actually. My the sound is not so good. So are there any other questions? Uh ah, this question, little exercises. Okay. Uh okay, sorry. So so maybe go go to Durant's book. Yeah. Durant's book is full of uh is full of uh yeah exercises and the details that to the reader and uh, yeah and funny stuff about this, yeah, this kind of, of, of mathematical objects. Yeah, sure. Okay. Are there any other uh, questions before we end the session? I have a small question about the assumption that small n is much smaller than big n. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, in the uh, coalescent time for some of size small n, the probability of coalescence is uh, n choose two over two capital N. So in that case, uh, so, so that is derived from I think it, it should be from the assumption that small n square is much smaller than big N. And so those, I mean, those pairs, the probabilities for those pairs to coalesce can be additive. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Right, you're right. And smaller than N. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually, so, so N is fixed, small n is fixed. Oh, pardon? Uh, I think, yeah, I think you can get results by letting small n go to infinity provided as you said that um, that n that n squared is much smaller than capital n okay. but uh, all these results are for small n fixed okay okay no. thank you yeah but you're right you could be interested in uh, the the joint limits of both commodities go to infinity provided that one of the one of the two small n is is relative is reasonably smaller than capital N. Yeah. Okay. 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 There, there might be yeah, there might be papers on this on this topic. Yeah. If you, if you can write me an email if you if you're interested. Uh, so could you recommend any paper? Uh, can you send me an email? I have to I have to check. I'm not sure that these papers do exist, but uh, I can check. Yeah. Okay, um, so maybe we should let uh, Omari go and have a very nice dinner. I, I guess it's probably time for that. And those of us on the East Coast will go and have a nice lunch. For the, for the semifinal. So, okay, the, so. Yeah, semifinal of the French uh, Tennis Open. Ah, there we go. Okay, so. Uh, okay, so um, we'll see you all uh, in a week. We'll, we'll try to send you a, a reminder um, and again, just instructions for how to get to the lecture next week. And again, we should be posting a video in the slides uh, soon on the website. So uh, we hope you take another look. All right, well, thank you very much, Omar. We'll see you in a week. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.